Yeah, hello, liebe and with that, hello and welcome, dear colleagues from the various media outlets in Italy and Denmark. I'm calling to you today live here from Ingolstadt from a highly sought-after cockpit. Because, well, over half, or almost half, of our customers in Europe are taking seat behind such a cockpit because they want to drive with the strength of the two hearts, i.e. with a combustion engine and with an electric motor on top. Easy to charge and with the full everyday usability of an A7 Sportback. And with that feeling of driving electrically with a zero emission locally, that brings us right to the heart of our topic today. Because this is the Tech Talk plug-in hybrids and we are happy and delighted to have you here on board with us. Because this is one possibility that we can meet and talk to one another in this time of the corona pandemic to hear from you, to hear your opinion on a given topic. So, in the next 25 minutes, we will give you an overview on the entire topic. Before we then look forward to hearing from you and your questions, and to this end, you really can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen, send in your questions, or later, if you want, press the hand to actually get live on show here. So, what have we got in store with you? We'd like to start out with a number of questions. Whether, for example, plug-in hybrid is just a transitional technology, what are the R&D goals we are pursuing here at Audi? But we also would like to take a look at some more controversial topics like the user profile of these vehicles and their drivers. Then we want to talk about taxation, subsidies and the likes, just as much as we want to take a closer look at consumption and consumption metering. But what's more? We've got a colleague here who knows what the dealers have to do because he trains the dealers and the showrooms because he knows what customers expect of plug-in hybrids and what questions they come with into such showrooms. Last but not least, we also take a look into the crystal ball where we look at what's happening in the way of range, everyday usability and sportiness. Might there even be highly sportive RS models with plug-in hybrid technology on board? So, let's get started. And let's ask ourselves, with my colleague Ralph Fage, what is it that the customers really want from the plug-in hybrids? He comes from the Audi product and sales training. So tell us, what are customers expecting from our plug-in hybrids? Well, to summarize, it's always three terms that keep coming up. Of course, first of all, they want to have a distinct electric drive experience. Secondly, simple and easy electric charging. And thirdly, everyday usability, as you just mentioned. Now, we summarize this as this triangle of objectives. And if you take a closer look at the three, then electric driving, of course, has a lot to do with range. But our customers associate, well, a certain expectation for the battery capacity to have that range, but also that they find intelligent systems on board of car to support them in their drive as far as possible, purely electrically. This, of course, in combination with good traction, obviously, I mean, you want to have the quattro all-wheel drive because the electric motor gives you so much torque. Then charging is the next item. People want to be easy and swift, whether that's at home or out and about. And of course, the charging shall also be a sustainable aspect. Thirdly, everyday usability. Like with any other Audi, of course, there's expectations on comfort, on dimensions, on the size of the trunk, on loading the car and the likes and loading through, but also the towing capacity. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these three aspects from an engineering side. To which end, I'm asking a second expert to join me here in the studio, Bernard Decker, our project manager for electrification. So welcome, Bernard. So Bernard, tell us, how do we implement this electric driving with the plug-in hybrids? Well, so Bernard, most importantly, with electric driving, we want to achieve the best possible electric range, of course. And I achieve this at the end of the day with a number of factors, but one specific aspect that need not be forgotten is, of course, the size and capacity of the battery. Now, if you take a look at our cars, A6, A7, A8, or Q7 and Q5, we're talking here about a energy content anywhere between 14 kilowatt hours all the way up to 17.3 kilowatt hours in a battery. So that is, well, that's a good figure. But the battery by itself is not such a determining factor, but it is the combination of intelligent powertrain management based on the various sensor data and vehicle data. And that management provides us with ideal recuperation so that we can have best possible and long electric drive patterns realized. And with that, of course, also we can minimize energy consumption. Now, all of this is supported by the clean transition between the different operating modes. And 
course, also through the total vehicle management. And with this, as I already said before, you achieve top recuperation energy while braking and while coasting. But what's vitally important is, of course, that we also have all these efficiency systems on board that we have integrated into the plug-in hybrids because they will manage the powertrain in such a way that you can drive very predictively with these cars. But I think we'll come back to the predictive driving later. Now, the aim of all this is, of course, that we use the given energy, both from the combustion engine, but also from the electric motor and electric capacity to use it most efficiently. And the most important aspect here is, of course, that the driver need not take care of anything. All of that happens in the background. So he can drive comfortably while cruising, or if he wants, be quite dynamic on the road. It's no problem whatsoever, because all of this is managed in the background with him, him barely having to notice. Okay. So that's the drive experience, but what about charging, the second aspect? How do you charge a battery uh, plug-in hybrid? Well, there's two possibilities, of course. You can charge at home, which is 90% actually of all charging procedures. And with, I mean, what do we have here? 7.4 kilowatt charging capacity. I think that's ideal because it takes less than two and a half hours to fill the battery from flat to full up again. So two and a half hours, I mean, you could do this overnight while you sleep or you sit in your office and are working, or maybe also you keep the car in the evening while you go, for example, to the gym or to the cinema. So I think that is really, that's really a good figure, two and a half hours. That's very usable in everyday situations. And it's a good compromise between technical complexity and simplicity in the handling for the customer. Because of course, in inner urban cities, I mean, these... Um, AC current sockets are something that you will find most often, while at the same time, of course, you can also do so at home in your garage, for example. It's easy to install. So that brings us to the third aspect of our target triangle. Of course, we offer an Audi with a trunk, as you would expect, but with a plug-in hybrid for your engineers, that is a bit of a challenge, no? Indeed, that is a challenge because, I mean, it's not that easy to just fit the battery into the trunk and that's it. No. I mean, you want to ensure everyday usability is a given to have the package with the trunk of volume so that you can actually fill the car up and with that you can secure and ensure that this car, well, just behaves like any other Audi, as you would expect from an Audi. And you can use this Audi without any limitations. And we've achieved this by having the battery and the electric components integrated very weight and space savingly here, as you see underneath the trunk floor. This means we've got a flush trunk floor and also the capacity to load through without any obstacles being in the way if, for example, you fold down the rear seats so you can even fit big sizable objects into the car. But also there's practical aspects that need to be considered and that can be realized with the car. For example, towing. We've got a massive towing capacity and towing load. And as I said, also a sizable trunk volume. I'll give you the example of the A6 Avant. Now, as a plug-in hybrid, it has a trunk volume of 405 liters. Now you can say, okay, a conventional one has 560 liters trunk volume. But look, the loss here is only happening below the um, trunk floor. So that's the side storage area that we have. And this is where we've placed the battery. And it's a good compromise that any kind of system can live with, I think. Okay, so that's the concept. But let's now take a look at the models that are currently on offer that come as plug-in hybrid powertrains. So you can see it's the Q5, 55 TFSI E, which of course E signifying the electrified version. So these cars can be identified by the E. Then the A7, 55 TFSI E, that's our sporty, elegant, premium saloon that comes as a plug-in hybrid. Then one level up, you have the Q7 as a 60 TFSI E. Followed by our flagship D8 as a 60 TFSI E. And we'll come back to that car later. What's the engine versions we have here on board of these cars? And of course, also the A6 that we just heard earlier when we spoke about the trunk. But what's more, we're actually going to extend that lineup of plug-in hybrids. Is that right? Indeed. I'm permitted to say that much already today that in the compact class, the next weeks and months, we'll see the A3 plug-in hybrids to the market as well as to Q3 as a plug-in hybrid and then at the upper end we will also have this year a uh, sporty SUV coming as a plug-in hybrid namely the Q8 plug-in hybrid all coming to market still this year okay speaking of engines I mean there's a different powertrain versions on board is that right 
Indeed, depending on the markets and the model lines, you have two different power variants of the plug-in hybrids. For example, there's the ones with the 220 kilowatts, that's 299 PS and 490 Newton meters. That's the cars for the more comfort and more cost um, aware customers. And then we've got a more dynamic version with 270 kilowatts, that's 367 HP and um, 50 Newton meters of torque. But not enough with that. The dynamism of that version is also something that's evident when you look at the options, like 19 inch rims, then the Matrix LED headlights at the front, but also inside you will note you have leather Alcantara seat linings, but also, for example, a stainless steel pedal. Now, all these facts and figures, of course, can also be retrieved from the digital press kit. And by the way, in the Audi Media Center, you have illustrations, you've got images, you've got animations awaiting you, as well as clips, anything you would like to know about the plug-in hybrid. But let's drill this a little deeper and let's take a closer look at the engineering side which we always do in the tech talk because we assume that you are interested in the engineering side of what we're presenting so from my side studio i'm calling my colleagues Eckhart Kleindienz from the audio communication and another expert here next to him that's august exi who is responsible for the plug-in hybrid powertrain development so over to you Eki. Thank you, Wolfgang. Indeed, here, let's take a look at the powertrain of our plug-in hybrid models together with August. And it's a complex interplay between the electric motor and the combustion engine. So let's start right away with the combustion engine. With some models, we're using a V6, while others come with an inline four-cylinder. So why this difference, August? Well, look, this has to do with right sizing. In our mid-sized vehicles, like the Q5 and the A6, we're using a four-cylinder powertrain, while on our heavier vehicles, like for example the Q7 or the A8, we use a V6 combustion engine. This makes sure that the drive dynamic data and ratings, as well as the low fuel consumption, can be achieved for these cars. At the same time, our focus has also been placed on making sure that as much electrical stages can be driven purely electric or drive taps can be driven as much electric as possible so we've got a powerful electric motor on board that allows us also to have as many drive situation really covered by the electric drive train giving you an optimal ideal and balance of a strong powertrain and low fuel consumption and typical for audi we also of course have the all-wheel drive quattro on board for maximum traction and safety now, a key element, of course, of a plug-in hybrid is always the battery. As we already saw and heard, we're using the Q5 battery where we're speaking of about 14 kilowatt hours capacity. And of course, some of us may ask, is that sufficient? Is that enough for everyday usability to drive as much electric as possible? Indeed, that's a good question. We might not have the biggest battery in the 41 kilowatt hours in the Q7 with a 70.3 kilowatt hour capacity, but of course, we at Audi pursue a different approach here. We use the intelligent and very networked powertrain management system that allows us to use the given energy content to a maximum efficiency, and especially in real drive situations, to drive as much and as often as possible in the electric mode. And as Bernard said, we don't want to have a massive big battery here um, in any way blocking the trunk, but we want to give you the best possible everyday usability for you as a customer. And that's why we've also got other efficiency technology on board that shall help the customer to drive as efficiently as possible. That's the PEA, the Predictive Efficiency Strategy, and the POS, the Predictive Operating Strategy. The PEA is just repeating Smith, is the Predictive Efficiency Assist, and the POS, the Predictive Operating Strategy. They make sure we've got as much recuperation shares as possible and drive as much electric with the car as possible. Okay, you've given us already the acronyms PEA and POS, but what's the engineering side of these? And let's start with the PEA, the Predictive Efficiency Assist. But you probably already know this from our conventional models from Audi. The PEA uses the information given in the car, for example, the topographic data from the sat-nav, but also from the near-field sensors, like the front camera, which means PEA knows, for example, upcoming villages, conurbations, inclinations and drops, and it also, of course, knows the near vicinity of the vehicle and will thus manage the powertrain accordingly. So PEA is the near field management of the car and then decides when it will coast or recuperate. 
Yes. Which brings us to the second one, the POS, the Predictive Operating Strategy. What makes that so special? Well, the POS really looks at the energy management over the long haul, which means it manages the powertrain over the entire route. It knows exactly when you're, for example, on the motorway, where there's a traffic jam ahead of you, and what is the environment at your destination like. So, meaning, if it is the aim to have, uh, or if a destination is in any city, in a city setting, the energy content will be a strip of such a way that the last mile can be driven purely electrically, and so that the customer at the destination will be able to refill his storage and capacity battery to the full. Now, with all these helpers on board, the one or the other customer and driver will, of course, ask themselves, well, do I have to consider all of this while driving? Do I have to manage this myself? No, look, I can tell you straight away, as a driver, you need not worry at all. Powertrain control works in the background and really drives the operating strategy. So you can focus on driving. All that you will notice as a driver are these very gentle prompts from our active drive pedal. It will indicate it's time to recuperate now or it's time to coast. You already mentioned it, the active drive pedal as an efficiency tool. What else do you have on board to make our plug-in hybrids more efficient? Well, for the best electric range and for a swift heating of the cabin, we've got a very extensive thermal management on board. On top of that, with our plug-in hybrids, we can offer, including in the Q7, a so-called heat pump. This can use one kilowatt of electric power to generate three kilowatts of thermal power to heat up, for example, the cabin. It is connected to the cooling circuit of the air conditioning and uses, for example, the dissipating heat from the high voltage components to heat up the cabin. And this makes sure that, especially at extreme temperatures, our plug-in hybrids are particularly efficient and thus very efficiently on the road. Leaves us with one aspect, that's charging. Because our vehicles charge with up to 7.4 kilowatts charging capacity. Is that adequate? Is that correct? And is that right for the use case of our customers? Well, with the current battery capacities, the 7.4 kilowatt charging capacity are the ideal balance of charging speed and the additional technical effort for a hybrid vehicle. Which means, in no more than two and a half hours, the plug-in hybrid battery is fully charged. And this means that an Audi plug-in hybrid is ideally suited for the typical plug-in hybrid use case, namely charging no more than once or twice per day. A higher charging capacity is at the moment not necessary. But of course, this brings me back to my intelligent powertrain management, the PEA and POS, which support the customer to drive as many stages as possibly in pure electric mode, and thus to arrive as efficiently as possible at its destination. Well. Thanks, August, for this little technical deep drive in the powertrain management of our plug-in hybrids. But now let's have a look at some of these prejudices, or shall we call them the myths surrounding plug-in hybrid models. And to this end, I hand back over to you, Wolfgang. Well, thanks, Eki. I'll forward that question straight to Ralph. Is customers, are customers coming to you only asking for tax benefits and subsidies? Is that the reality? Well, as you said quite rightly, sometimes they do. Because, of course, money always plays a role when you buy a car. Of course, but that's not all. There's a lot more and many other good reasons why our customers are interested in plug-in hybrids. And to take a closer look at them, you, you, you have to distinguish between different customers. You've got, on the one hand, the private customer. Now, a private customer... That's, that's the ones who are really, I mean, they're convinced when they buy a plug-in hybrid. It's for them, sustainability, zero emission driving, I mean, quiet driving is something that's vitally important that they really put great um, value on. The corporate customers, well, here you have to distinguish between the smaller and the bigger corporations with smaller or bigger fleets. With the smaller fleets, you will find that the decision maker is often also the user of these cars. And here, the motivation is, well, quite similar. But of course, there's other aspects, like, for example, well, the, 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 the effect that branding such a car has, which for some bigger companies is also quite important. And of course, with large corporations, they also are, well, they, they are very precise in their calculations and accounting. There's a fleet manager, for example. He will look at the total cost of ownership at the end of the year, and he will say, well, well what is my cost of ownership for this car and for this user of the car? And of course, if um, somebody here is uh, realizing that um, by, by inappropriate use of this concept, the fuel consumption is a bit above average, well, he will, he will draw his own consequences. So we've got many key account customers who decide by, well, they're saying there's this one group of people, they're predestined, you're giving their use case to your driver plug-in hybrid. For example, your classic um, headquarter staffer. 
He drives into headquarters in the morning and takes the car back at home and just commute or goes to the cinema. And here you have to say, if you've got ranges or annual mileages below 30,000, that's ideal for them. But those above 30,000 kilometers, well, then our sales personnel, our consultants out there will say, hey, maybe a diesel is the right car or any other alternative powertrain, like, for example, natural gas powered cars. The G-Tron models could be a nice alternative. But at the end of the day, it's important that you have a due diligence, have really assessed the need of the client and really meet the needs of that client coming into the showroom and to offer him the best possible solution. So plug-in hybrids, I know, are really listing a lot of opinion, a lot of prejudices. And you read time again, Bernard, to you. Um, these are just cars that are just transition technology. Is this a speculation or is that a reality? Now, now, for us, this is absolute speculation. It's not a transition technology whatsoever. It's a sensible addition, this powertrain, the plug-in hybrid powertrain, in our entire powertrain portfolio. And it can offer you CO2 neutral mobility. Because when I mean, you can see, and you heard it already here from my colleagues, with a great share of electric driving or zero emissions driving locally, or as Ralph said, you've got commuters that, that well, they go cross-country and then into the city, well, cross-country, they drive with the combustion engine, but in the cities then with the electric motor. And this is, of course, important because you've got some cities that are considering banning combustion engines. And, of course, due to the, the emissions, um, that would be then an ideal alternative. And if you look especially at the last years, how hybrid technology has developed, then you will notice that it is becoming more and more important to have electric range and also electric performance available. And I think here, with that technology, it's everything else but a transition technology. It is really a technology here to stay. When you speak of locally zero emission driving, I mean, I know that some say electric vehicles, well, they don't really drive with green energy, green power. What do you tell the customers when they come up with this argument? Well, of course. Principally speaking, the share of renewables, for example, in the German energy mix, where we are right now, has developed massively over the last years. The year before, we had um, 47%, but in the first half of 2020, that share went up to 57%. So you can see this is getting better and better. But of course, you can influence this yourself. You can say, okay, I, I, I've got a photovoltaic system at my home or, or my company headquarters. And of course, that is renewable energy that I'm using. Or for example, you're using the group offer from Volkswagen. Volkswagen natural renewable power. That's the best way. So what do customers need in order to connect their car to the grid? Well, they need, of course, the necessary charging equipment, which is, of course, already given with the car, both at home or at the public infrastructure, charging infrastructure. And if you charge at home, where about 90% of all the charging sequences are taking place, of course, sometimes people ask, what do I have to do? What do I have to fit at home to my garage to make this possible so that it's an ideal match? I mean, of course, ideal meaning the 7.4 kilowatt charging capacity. Well, we can offer you on the Audi Heim page a so-called mobility check, where you just, with a few mouse clicks, can inform yourself what's needed, and um, you get a good overview how your current situation will help you. And if need be, you can also have an ask for a so-called home check, which means we will support you in assessing your needs or your situation. For example, an electric engineer or technician comes to your home, looks at what you have, will make a recommendation and maybe even, well, apply and make the installation because he's got a little material in his suitcase to do so at quick and easy notice. Well, journalists keep noticing time and again that the consumption of plug-in hybrids um, in reality is higher than what is specified in the sales brochure. Now, why is that? And how do you actually meter a plug-in hybrid in its fuel consumption? Well, basically speaking, says Bernard, compared with many other powertrain versions, the plug-in hybrid um, can have a very varying consumption because it depends, first of all, on the concept. You've got, of course, two concepts together, the combustion engine and the electric motor, which can, I mean, work either together or single, each one by themselves, and therefore it also very much dependent on the custom profile, how he uses the car. But having said so, how do we meter this? Well, it's actually metered the same as any conventional car is metered according to the WLTP cycle. 
And you, I mean, it's, it's quite simple. Compared to a combustion engine, of course, that's conducted slightly different because I have a certain electric range that I can realize with the plug-in hybrid. So the WLTP cycle is repeated so often or a number of times because when you start out, you've got the battery that's fully charged and you drive as often until the battery is flat and or the combustion engine is started on top. And then this last cycle where the combustion engine is active, then you determine what is my electric range and how much is my fuel consumption or should we say my CO2 emissions. All of this is then calculated together using factors and the result afterwards is that what you see listed in the various brochures. Now, for us, however, the principle, and August has just said so before, I mean, it means you can be very efficient with the plug-in hybrid and that means Many of the systems on board are made available to the customer to realize this. And so we can say, um, and we're convinced that our plug-in hybrids have, uh, I would say, the single digit fuel consumption when it is a plug-in hybrid. So at the end of the day, to have the best ideal electric range, indeed. But of course, then the, course, the question beckons, why don't you just use bigger batteries? Why don't you take the battery from the e-tron and then you can drive 400 kilometers? It's not such a bad idea, actually, that you mentioned here. But, of course, that brings us back to what we said earlier about this target triangle. Because implementing this makes it a bit difficult and you have to, well, make bad compromises. A big battery means where well, you need package volume, you need trunk volume. You have to fit that battery somewhere. And then at the end of the day, well, everyday usability is prejudiced, of course, with that approach. And this is exactly where... I mean, we want to set ourselves apart. We want to offer great everyday usability. And what we've learned is that... Given the compact build of our battery, given the huge efficiency that we are yielding from our system and the support of the systems, our plug-in hybrids really are the correct right-sized um, concept for these vehicles. To give you just two or three figures here from the statistical evaluation. Um, we just heard recently or found out that the average customer who lives in the city drives no more than 60 km, 16 kilometers per day. Those living in the suburbs drive about 30 kilometers per day. I mean, that's exactly what you can do here with these plug-in hybrids. I mean, you can drive it either fully electric or in combination. And I mean, these are all ranges that the plug-in hybrids can easily match. And so we are convinced what we've got here is absolutely right and meets the market need here as we talk. We at Audi are also quite convinced as well that the plug-in hybrids are the right offer to drive with zero emissions locally because we are really driving a complete model offensive. So let's have a look in the future to which end I'll ask my two colleagues from the other studio to join me once more, Eki Kleinitz and August Exi. Because August, what have you got up your sleeve when you look to the next few years? Well, for the development of the future plug-in hybrids, we've got two development targets. That is, we want to extend, of course, the electric range, while at the same time, we want to retain the everyday usability that we mentioned earlier today a number of times. Now, the electric range, of course, depending on the model, will come anywhere close to 80 kilometers. So with the future models, the energy content of the battery will increase, while at the same time, the dimensions of the battery will remain virtually identical. So that the customer will not have uh, in any way prejudiced trunk compartment and still can load through. Now, given the increased battery capacity, the customer receives that top range, electric range, and that's also why we consider, of course, increasing charging capacity from currently 7.4 kilowatts to a little more, so that we can keep the charging time close and where it is today at two and a half hours, which I think is a good fit and match for the future of plug-in hybrids. Eki, will there also be sporty models in the future or maybe RS models? Certainly, that's an aspect that we're looking at. In future, you will see sporty, performing RS models coming as plug-in hybrids, meaning they will come with a plug-in hybrid powertrain. So, I mean, this is, as I said, will be coming in the middle and upper class segment in future to give the customers a complete new drive experience, what we call pure electric driving on the one hand, but at the same time also the interaction of a very performant and strong combustion engine and a very strong electric motor, which of course is a particularly appealing drive experience. And I mean, it's a consistent step in our electrification strategy that we will take in future. So you've defined the targets for the developers, is that right? Yes, indeed. I mean, we spoke about that target triangle, electric driving, electric charging and everyday usability. 
And that is now simply extended by another dimension, and it is performance and, well, power. That's the new dimension. So, if you speak about, well, the cars, the RS models come from our sports company, then, of course, you can well imagine these will be high, powerful um, powertrains coming with a plug-in hybrid technology to give the customers the performance they're looking for, but, of course, also to extend them by the factor of electric range and electric drivability, but also to give the emotional appeal that these cars retain and still have. Now, we look forward to your questions, dear guests, and um, let's summarize once more. What are the advantages of the plug-in hybrids? For whom are they suited? And what role will they play with Audi? Ralph, over to you. Well, plug-in hybrids at Audi are part and parcel of our electrification strategy. Depending on the country and model line, we've got, um, well, take-up rates anywhere between 30 to 50 percent already. So I really can say this is the new normal in our customer groups. Plug-in hybrids, well, will be the standard soon or already the new normal and it will be part and parcel of what you see on the road. Now, for whom are these cars? Well, you can say this course um, has a wide customer group. There's some customers who are interested in total costs of ownership. Then. There's those who really are concerned about sustainability, and there's quite a few of them. And then we have those customers who love this instant talk of the electric motor when they put metal to the pedal. Then there's those customers who love the quiet drive of the plug-in hybrids. And there's customers who love the comfort. I mean, many don't even notice this. You only realize when you drive them that no matter at which season you're driving the car, I mean, auxiliary heating will always heat the cabin up to 21 degrees or cool it down to 20 degrees. So, I mean, it's hard to, to, to pinpoint it in real life because all of these advantages and all of these elements will always be a given and I think the perfect balance in our products is certainly a given and many of these claims can be met with the plug-in hybrids. So plug-in hybrid offers you all the possibilities of driving electrically and with zero emissions you just have to use these opportunities and possibilities. So thanks to the colleagues here in the studio, thanks to everybody live online. The next Tech Talk will happen soon and we will address you. So thanks, and see you soon again. Goodbye.